I hate introductions. <laughs> Most of the time they're just lies. <laughs> the reason I hate introductions is no matter how, what they say about you, when you get to the end of the week, everybody has their own opinion anyway. <laughs> and they know their own truth from what that is. Anyway, uh, it's been my pleasure to be friends with Nate and uh, I had planned to take him with me to China and was going to start using him as my, my second man, but uh, my folks are 94 years old and they're having uh, end of life issues, and so I had to retire from preaching and move to uh, San Angelo, Texas, out in the middle of nowhere, and take care of my folks, and that means no more uh, trips. And this is the first meeting I've held in two years, because it's the first time I felt comfortable enough with my folks situation to come. So, you're my guinea pigs on being able to, to do this. The work in China is absolutely interesting. Uh, friend Wilson Copeland asked me uh, one year, he said, uh, why don't you go to China with me? And I said, okay, when do you want to go? And he said, well, I'm leaving in uh, April. And I said, I have my uh, pass already. And so, five weeks later, I was on an airplane going to, to China. And so one of the things that happened is how do you get people to talk to you? And the first thing I found out is if you're American and you're visiting there, they want to talk to you. And so we had no problem whatsoever. But what we did was we would go down to the universities and every university in, in China has what they call an English corner. And that's where everybody goes to practice English. And so, speaking English, I don't need much practice, we would go down there, and the moment they found out you're from America, every student on campus that spoke any English, and they have all of their students learning English starting in fourth grade, mandatory. So fourth grade through the end of high school, every Chinese student studies English as a second language. So we would do that, and one of the things we would do, since uh, we weren't really supposed to be teaching the Bible there, but we did anyway, was we would invite them uh, up to our hotel room, and we said, we'd like to show you something. And this is the presentation that every preacher that I know that has ever gone to China has a copy of this. And their copy is much longer, because the original copy, it took us... Uh, two hours to present to the Chinese students. I'm going to do it much shorter this morning because uh, I, you don't have to read all the stories, but we would make them read the uh, stories in Genesis. Uh, so we had to read the stories and talk about the stories and explain. But anyway, we would start this. The Chinese language is the oldest continuous uh, written language in existence together. There were some that were older, but they're not used anymore. They're gone, the Sumerians and, and that. But uh, the Chinese is still uh, being written. It's changed over the years considerably on that. And uh, it started some 4,500 years ago, about uh, 500 years before Abraham. They were already beginning to write uh, Chinese language. And the, what they first did was as language has progressed, they began drawing pictures. And so the pictures became the language, and then eventually what happened, uh, pictures stood for concepts, and then it developed from there. But their language has maintained these pictures. And so even today when you see the Chinese language, it is a form of these ancient pictures uh, that they, they drew. And to get complex things, they would take two pictures and they would stick them together and they'd end up with all these scribbles all over everywhere. And uh, as they began to do this, for example, uh, that was just an easy way to represent the word mouth. And so then they would add to that the representation of man. And so when you put the two of those together, uh, what you end up with is the older brother and the thought behind that is the oldest male member in this was the spokesperson for the family. 
And so when daddy died, the older brother got to be the spokesperson. So this was simply a way of putting things together, and it represents uh, uh, the older brother on that. So the problem as we go through all of this, uh, they would start with just very simple things, and then it got more and more and more complex as it went along. The observation in this lesson uh, have been documented. Now, I don't know whether Nate has developed this habit or not, but I do. When somebody puts a footnote and represents and says you, they took it from this text, I always buy the textbook and read it for myself. <laughs> I don't trust people to quote accurately from context. Well, so I bought the book. And then I found out that several language scholars had answered his book. So I bought their book. And then he answered the answer, so I bought his second edition, and they answered, and I bought that, and then he brought a third book out. So I got a little shelf at home <laughs> that deals just with this uh, issue. And what I'm going to tell you is what I tell the Chinese students. I don't know that this is all totally 100% accurate, but it's the best explanation that anybody's come up with on why we end up with all of these pictures and, and how they uh, will tell the story of the earlier part of the book of Genesis on this. And the problem with word studies is, for example, I was studying in a Bible class one time, and the preacher said, now, the word atonement, and you can see by the letters of that that it really started off as at one minute. That's absolutely false. It did not start off that way. Uh, to atone is totally different than at one. Now, the consequence of being atoned is that you are brought back together into a one relationship, but that is not what the word meant. It didn't have anything to do with it. But you can see that's the problem with words. And that's the problem with this particular study, that as we begin to cover... <coughs> I thought I stuck it in my pocket. Y'all can hear me anyway, can't you? Yes. Okay. Usually that's true. Thank you. Now that's on the record. <laughs> uh, so as we begin looking at these, the Chinese pictures are a little different than that because they're actually pictures. And so you can actually still see the, the picture as it was developed and they've added and changed uh, the words to that. So it's a little bit easier on the etymology, the study of the, the beginning, than it would be just with the English language on that. Now, the problem goes back to really the, this, that before the time of Buddha, which is the basic national religion, well, the national religion is communism and atheism, but uh, those that had religious roots, it was Buddhism that uh, was primarily there. And as you begin looking at that, when you go clear back before Abraham, and, and you look at the people that were in China, uh, what they did was they uh, actually worshipped uh, one god. And they worshipped one god that was a spirit being, and they offered sacrifices unto this one god that they called Shangdi. And so this is the picture uh, for the, the, the word god, or Shangdi, that they used. It's interesting to me that you go back there and it was not idolatry and it was not Buddhism and it was not, it was this ancient sacrificial thing to the one supreme being that, and uh, you're going, that sounds vaguely familiar to what we have done on that. And so this was taught through the first uh, uh, three dynasties, the, the Sha, Sheng, and Chao dynasties of that. And they worshipped just this one God, and they did so with the animal sacrifices that they gave to this one God. And then Buddha comes along. Now, Buddha started over in India uh, somewhere around 500 B.C. Uh, the dates, if you look it up, even on Wikipedia, are going to be all over the, the board. But we'll just use 500. It's an easy number. But it didn't get to China until about 50 B.C. It took... 400 years for that to migrate over to China. So what you have was uh, they worshipped this one god and then Buddha came along and that was pretty good and then all of a sudden uh, what happens is the Europeans showed up in China and the Europeans brought the Bible and they brought the story of God to them and so the Chinese people today that we've met, most of them think of the Bible as 
a Western book uh, between Europe and America, Western civilization. And so what we tried to do was to explain to them uh, that it's not a Western book. And so being a Western book, they just, it's full of myth and fabric and silly stories that nobody ever believed. And uh, because of that, we have to go through this. Now, you all have studied this and seen that the Bible was not written in English, but was written in Hebrew and Greek. And that's not Western, that's Eastern languages on that. And it was first written, uh, Moses down in Egypt and on up into Babylon. And that's clearly not Western, that's uh, Eastern. And their language and the location, the five books written by Moses, and uh, who was the adopted son of the king and the pharaoh of, of Egypt. You all know this story. See, we had to explain this to the Chinese. It took hours. And, uh, that. But uh, all of that, what you see from that is, the Bible is not a Western book. It is an Eastern book. Written in Eastern language to Eastern people about Eastern history. Uh, what took place. And so one of the questions that they always ask is, well, if it's an Eastern book, where is China mentioned in the Bible? And I found an obscure passage in the book of Isaiah that uh, possibly one of the places mentioned could mean, maybe. <laughs> and so I just tell them, I said, well, actually, the history of the Chinese people is in the first 11 chapters. Uh, actually, on over to the flood of Noah, when after the Babylonians, uh, they built that... Uh, pyramid thing that then they all left. Okay. Where did they go? Well, they left and they went to China. And so we have the history of the Chinese people as the history of the beginning of all mankind, and then we don't hear about them again. And uh, so they, they're not mentioned. So we're going to simply show some of these early Chinese characters on that. For example, the Chinese would have migrated and the way they migrated was the way they always migrated back 2,000, 3,000 years ago. They walked, and they would have walked uh, from uh, the eastern part, and they would have walked, or from the western part, they would have walked east. Now, anytime you look at a map like this, if north is up, that means east is to the right and west is to the left. So they would have walked east. So when they began talking about where was their homeland, well, their homeland was in the west. So what happened was they put together a word, uh, and it's going to talk about migrate. So here's all of these different things, and it talks about the great division west and wall. Those are the four picture words, and that's exactly what happened. After the Tower of Babel, the great division among all the people, the people walked out of the west. So what you end up with is the, this, this word. Now, where did the Chinese learn that there was a great division that caused them to migrate? And that was 4,000 plus years ago? And the answer is, the Bible tells you the story. And that's where this is. They walked uh, from the West. Now, then we have them read from Genesis. And the Lord formed man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And so what we have is we have uh, to talk and to walk is the idea of the creation. Uh, interesting. Uh, we talk about creation and means the heavens and the earth and the stars and, and all of that. But uh, they took the word creation primarily from the idea of the creation of man. And so we begin putting those together. And then you begin. And uh, the idea of talking came because they put together the words dust and breath of mouth and alive. Well, my question is, where did the dust come from? I can begin seeing the breath and the, the alive part, but what you have from the beginning was God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him and he became a living man and uh, they were talking about that. So when you have the idea of the word first, they take the word alive, and they take the word dust, and they take the word man, and now they have the word first. I mean, how I challenge you. Go home and draw a picture this afternoon, a little stick picture, that I would immediately recognize as first. 
Now, if, if you mean drawing a one, <laughs> it can do that. But one doesn't always mean first. But this is how they got first. But the way they got first was a living dust man. And so having read Genesis chapter 2, they would look at that and they would look at the chart and that one girl just sat there and looked at it and she said, wow, this is incredible. I said, no, it's not. It's amazing, but it's believable. It's credible. Uh, just take a look at the evidence of that. So 4,500 years ago, the Chinese believed that there was, and uh, the first person living was a living dust man or a man made out of dust, and that, that's a Bible story. So uh, the picture of God, Shang Di, plus one, plus man, and what you have is a garden. So if you wanted a picture of a garden, now, you again, go home and draw me a stick picture so that I would know that's a garden. And the way they did that was they went back to this original dust man, one man, God, in a garden. That would be a garden. And so they ended up uh, doing this. And that's easy for us to see, but it was amazing to them. Now, the Garden of Eden from China is back over to the West. Uh, when uh, Moses wrote this, Moses lived on over to the west, so the Garden of Eden was to the east of Moses when he wrote this. Uh, so how do we get this idea of west? Well, we took one, and we took man, and we took garden, and when you put one man garden, it was west. How do you get that? And Nate asked me about this because he did what my brain did. I'm going, wait a minute. Then. They went east. Yeah, but when they got east, the one man that was in the garden, he lived back in the west. And so when they wanted to picture where west was, or how to talk about west, they just pointed back to the one man in the garden. And that became their symbol for the word west on that. And then he created in this garden several trees. And we asked the question after we read this to them, how many special trees were there? And they go, there were two special trees that they uh, were not supposed to eat uh, uh, from that. And so they, they were pretty good. So we have them then begin reading this out of the, the original Chinese. And the word forbidden comes from two trees and they put together the word command. And so uh, how, do you, how do you draw a stick figure that means forbidden? And the answer was you go back to the Garden of Eden story. And you have two trees and command. Don't eat of those trees. And then it goes on and talks about the woman went ahead and ate the forbidden fruit uh, on that. We have them read this whole text together. And how would you draw a picture of coveting? Well, I would probably have really an involved diagram here. But they simply end up with this. And again, what you see is there was the, the symbol of the two trees uh, up at the top part of that. And down at the bottom part was a woman. So what story has a woman and two trees that would say anything about desire and coveting? And the answer is, well, the book of Genesis tells the story of the woman and the two trees and coveting the fruit and eating of the fruit and from that. And so then they developed the, the picture of Satan. Well, how do we draw a picture? I would have drawn a little depth, you know, a little pitchfork and a tail uh, on that. But uh, this is not that type of picture language. This is stick picture language on that. So they drew this, and they, again, they took the word life and uh, secret or private and garden, and they put those together. And where did we first meet Satan? And the answer is in the garden. And so here we have in the garden again, and this becomes the symbol for Satan. So now take uh, the word devil, Satan, and the word tempter, and put two trees together. And now what you have is the word covering. Because after Satan tempted man and they ate of the fruit, what did God have to do? He made clothes so that they were now covered. So how do you get the word covered? And again, if you try to draw me a stick figure, you're not going to draw this. But if it came out of Genesis slowly and developed, then you begin seeing this. So let's take the word naked. And what they did was they combined the word man and fruit. How do you combine man and fruit and end up naked? 
Uh, don't try that at the grocery store. Uh, the, the problem that you have with that is the story of Genesis is very easy to see. Well, they had two words for naked. Because there was Eve that was in the garden and she didn't have any clothes either. So what you have is, is they did that. So uh, let's talk about the word pain. Uh, I, someday I'm going to write a, a hymn. I'm going to call it an ode to pain. Because pain is a very good thing. I know we don't like that, but it's that's a whole sermon. Anyway, uh, the, how do you draw that? How do you have a picture? So what they did was they took the idea of the two trees. See that up at the top again? And then the, the bottom of that they combined with uh, the word uh, of peace. And uh, this one I'm not really too sure about because even the Chinese students went, well, yeah, I can see how that, that could work. A piece of what? Well, a piece of the tree. Well, a piece of the two trees. And so a piece of fruit that's been taken from the trees and the result of eating it was pain. Uh, so all of the pain and the suffering and the weeds we experience that same. So now we have the, the murder where Cain uh, killed Abel and the older brother, uh, the eldest son, is going to kill the younger son on that. So here again, remember, we have the mouth man. I like that because I have an older brother. And that's my, uh, what I call him. He's the mouth man. Anyway, okay, uh, from that. But you put that together and you end up with the word cruel. And they added a few more things. Now the interesting thing about that is that the way that the uh, older brother is pronounced, what that word is in, in the uh, Chinese language, is, is the word shun. And the problem with that is, is that that also is uh, the same word uh, for violent. And so from a language standpoint of listening to it, from context you can tell whether that's the older brother or whether that's violent. But again, it goes right back to the story of Cain and Abel. And the older brother slew the younger brother violently and so we end up with this picture language that came straight out of that. Then there was the great flood. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And we have fun telling the story and having them read it out of English and then asking these questions and they talk about the boat and, and uh, uh, you know, how many people were on the boat and uh, they get all of this stuff. But you got to remember, they've never seen this. Most of them have never seen a Bible. Uh, and so opening up and reading this uh, together and they would read this story and laugh and giggle and you know the first time impression and then we began showing them well here's part of the problem and the reason whoever put this chart this is not my chart I don't know who the first preacher was from the church that started going over there but he adopted it from somebody that adopted it from these books and so he, he did all of this fancy, I don't do that in my PowerPoints. Mine, when you see the rest of the week, are very simple. But he has them fly in. But you'll notice uh, that he starts and it comes in. Picture of the boat. Now, how did you get the boat? What symbols made up that word for boat? And the answer is, well, uh, they took the word person and they took the word eight, and they took the word boat, and they put them together, and they ended up with their large ship. Now, I would have taken a cheap way out. I would have just drawn a big boat. <laughs> but uh, what they did was they represented, well, how do you get big boat out of eight people in a And the answer is the story of Noah. How many people in the boat? Well, there were eight. And again, at that point in time, uh, usually they go, wow, this is, and so we've got them hooked. Because all we're trying to do is we want them to come back and read the Bible with us. And we've got them hooked now. That's why we use this chart. We're not trying to prove the point. We're just trying to get them hooked to come and read the Bible and study with us about the story of, of mankind, which includes the story of Adam and Eve. So how did the ancient people know about the thing? They didn't have a Bible. Now, back to this, the idea of total. They took A and uh, united and earth. And so the idea of total 
Well, how many people were left after the flood? Well, the total number of people was eight. So they took the story of Noah, and that represented total on that. The same thing when they took the word uh, total and added water, then they had the word flood. And so how, how, how would you explain this if you don't believe what I'm telling you? How would you come up with all of these things that are straight out of the story of Genesis uh, if it didn't develop from the story of Genesis? And the Chinese students are smart enough, they all looked at us and said, I don't think there's another explanation. We got them hooked. Now they're going to come back and they're going to study the Bible with us. So uh, as we do this, how did the ancient people know all about this? And the answer is because their history is our history. Because they're people. And all people's story is the book of Genesis 1 through 12. 1 through 11, and then Abraham starts a new chapter. But my point on that is, that's not just the story of the Jews. That's the story of the Africans and the Russians and the Americans and everybody that is a person. And so what we're trying to get them to see is, this is not an American book. It's not an American religion. This is God's story of mankind. And it's China's story on that. So many of the things they tell of one God creating man. Shangdi. <laughs> and sometimes the Chinese students would offer that. Uh, okay, yeah, right. You've got the, the name of your ancient God, but I believe it was one. Uh, the garden and the trees and the fruit. Uh, well, they never heard of that. But now they have. And so they understand the book of Genesis, the beginning. Uh, the, the beginning of China, that they came and uh, from the West. Uh, uh, so as they came from the West, then they came. That's the story of migration and walking after the Great Division. And there's the history of the Chinese uh, people. And it all started clear back there with eight people in a boat making a big ship. Does anybody know where Noah kept the termites? <laughs> it's just something that I've always wondered about. But uh, uh, between the termites and the woodpeckers, I, I don't know what happened. But anyway, the uh, eight people in the boat is the history of the Chinese people because it's the history of all of mankind and that. And so we, we got them hooked now. That, so what we're telling them is these stories all happened long before the Bible was written. Because you've you got to come all the way down to Moses about 1,400 years before Jesus. But by that time, the Chinese had already been over in China for 1,500 years. <laughs> so you're, you're backing up, clear back past the beginning of China, clear back past the migration that they came, clear back. And this tells the same story to them. And explains how, how they got there. Uh, not only of the Chinese, but also of the Japanese. I'm going to bring this up later uh, when we talk about that. But every country, their nationalism gets in the way. And I don't care which country it is. And uh, in China, uh, I did some work clear up right on the, the border. Uh, by North Korea, and uh, up there, that was where Japan first entered to the Chinese, and the atrocities that were committed uh, are awful. And so one old man used to come to our Bible studies, and he would show up in the morning, and he would stay all day. And uh, we would have several different groups come and go, and he would sit there the whole day. He was an interesting man. He brought two tape recorders. And uh, he would start one, and about 15 minutes into the lesson, he would stop it and start the other one. And uh, about 10 minutes into that one, he would stop and start the first one over again. I don't know how he ever listened to any of these things. And uh, he never asked any questions until I was teaching him the book of Ephesians, and I got to the idea of the Jew and the Gentile being combined. And uh, so you're going to have to learn to love your neighbor, whoever your neighbor is. And he says, if I became a Christian, would I have to love the Japanese? 
And I said, absolutely. He said, I can't do that. And so what happens is, is that they did, so we use this story with him to show him that you're really no different than they are. Uh, there was a point in time where your history is diverged, but if you go back before that, they're your brethren. They're your people. We're all one in the Lord uh, as far as being people and can hear the gospel message. So this is how we use these stories on that. And uh, they were then written down in the Bible. And that allowed us to talk a little bit about how the history of the Bible came about and how they wrote it and, and all of the various people on what they have done. So after we've done that, now we get them to come and talk with us about the Bible. Wow. What do you tell somebody that has never seen a Bible and you want to have a Bible study with them? Where would you start? And we don't know. We have tried everything that we can think of, and some things work sometimes, and some things don't work at other times, and uh, we've done that. An amazing thing, though, is going on, and that is underground movement in China. Uh, the, the communist government can't stop it. And what we found was uh, everybody we met was uh, willing to talk about church. Many of them were already uh, parts of what we call house churches. Uh, and all denominations do exactly what I've done. You go over there and you begin teaching the Bible and you start little house churches. Now, what the house churches don't do over there is they don't call them Baptist house churches and Methodist house churches. And of course, we don't encourage the people to call them Church of Christ house churches. Uh, we just want them to be the church. But it's hard to distinguish. So we have to be very careful with the brethren over there that they don't just indiscriminately accept everybody and everybody's teaching. So somebody asked, well, where are you? You know, first floor? Thing I could. We're not even in the basement yet because these people don't know anything. And so we have to start and we have to, to show them absolutely everything. The nature of God. The nature of the Bible. We have to start from underneath the basement and, and build this foundation to do that. And here was my problem on that, was I could be gone for about four weeks and then my elders expected me to be home and do my work over here that they were supporting me to do. And besides, uh, the Chinese government won't let me stay any longer now. And what happens is, is you can get a, a, a visitor's visa that you go in there, but like every 60 days or 90 days, you have to leave the country. Well, that means you go down to Hong Kong, that's out of the country, and then you come back in, and now you can stay another 90 days. But my wife said, no, you can't. <laughs> so we would go, and then we'd have to leave. One year, we baptized 20 people. And we had to leave. What were they going to do the next time? They've never been in church. They don't know. And so we tried to uh, teach them about the Lord's Supper and about getting together and singing. How are they going to sing? What are they going to say? You know, we have songbooks, and if you don't have songbooks, we're going to goodwill, and you can find used songbooks. I mean, there's we have in so many options in this country, but over there, there are no songbooks. You go to the bookstores, you can't just go buy what you want to. So somebody, one of American preachers, got together with some of the Chinese, and they printed up their own little mimeograph uh, book. And uh, what they did was they simply went through and they, they used not the Chinese characters, they used pinyin, and that is they used the American uh, alphabet to give you the words and uh, so that you could do that and they made their own little song book but there's no music which was an amazing thing and so they have to memorize the tunes now one of the things they've done and I don't know how much music you all have done but I was uh, 
a professional musician who studied that. And uh, once you see what they've done with shape notes in our book, and so there's seven shapes and there's seven tones. So rather than using shape notes, they just use numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to sing Do, you sang one, and Re was two, and Mi was three. And I took one look at that, and we got one particular song, and they said, we like the words of this, but we don't know what the tune is. And I said, well, the tune goes like this. And so I just sang the numbers to them. And uh, uh, they all went to me kind of funny. They said, well, how did you know that? And I said, because of the numbers. But see, they don't know about music. They don't know about uh, the Bible. So we left every time we go. We take a pile of Bible help books, concordances, maps, uh, general introductions, you know, Roy Cogdo wrote a book by book thing, and we, we take all of these, and, but we have to take just absolutely very simple beginning books so that they, they have something to study. And then when we come back, what we try to do is we, we set up Skype, and uh, they can get on Skype and we can have lessons. Now, one of the problems is um, Wilson lives in Florida, and that's in the same time zone, and it's exactly 12 hours different than China. Can you imagine China is almost the same size as the United States, and it's all in one time zone? Mm -hmm. I want to tell you what, the people on the western side of China suffer in business because the business hours are really early, early, early morning for them, and it's just, and it's terrible. But I lived at that time in Tucson, and so uh, when it was 8 o'clock in the morning over here, it was 8 o'clock in China in the night. So Wilson had these really great Skype lessons, and he could, he could talk with them at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he'd tell me, he says, you need to get on there with me. And I said, Wilson, do you realize it's 5 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> and you want me to try to decipher Chinese English at 5 o'clock in the morning? I said, uh, it won't work. So I moved now to San Angelo, and it, it's only 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but it's still, for me, it doesn't work. So Wilson... Uh, started doing this and he has his Skype lessons and uh, we have lessons with them and we, we can do that. We've gotten them where they will do their own Bible study and have the Lord's Supper and sing and, and worship and then after that uh, get together with Wilson and do the Skype lesson on one. But it's, it's tough work and it's hard work. I have a much greater appreciation for Paul coming to Thessalonica and starting a little church and three weeks later leaving. Do you all remember what you knew about Christianity the third week of your life as a Christian? I can tell you what I knew. N nothing. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the Bible when I was baptized, and three weeks later, I knew I was baptized, and I knew why. But I didn't know anything about elders and instrumental music and uh, Genesis and Noah. And, uh, but I had to learn all that stuff. Well, they're in the same boat except for one problem. There's nobody to teach them. And they can't go down to a bookstore and buy a good book on it. Uh, I got on Amazon in China. And I was trying to see what was available. Well, there were a couple of Bibles available, but there's only two translations in China. One's bad and the other's worse. <laughs> but that's what there is. So we complained, you know, about arguing with those King James only folks over here, and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. What they have in China makes King James look really inspired. <laughs> but it's not. And so how do you begin teaching them? Uh, and they have to, to read this. So we're not anywhere. And we're, we're starting in the basement. And it, it's turned worse in the last few years. The premier that is there now does not want us to ever come back. They not want any foreign preachers, period, coming in. And if you come, you can only come 
as a tourist to go over and see the terracotta soldiers. Uh, but can't talk to the people. And so Wilson and I have gone, I didn't get to see the Great Wall. First year I was there, I told Wilson, I said, okay, I'm adding one extra day while we're in Beijing, and I'm going to see the Great Wall. And uh, so we did, and I went and I saw uh, one of the uh, silk factories, and I saw where they carved uh, the green uh, stone. So, but we don't go as tourists. And we hit the ground running, and we, we teach, and we study with them. And one, one group, we baptized some 20 people one year. And after we left, the Chinese government rounded them all up and said, if you talk to any more American Greek, you're going to go to one of the relearning schools, <laughs> hard labor. And so they then further threatened, in fact, if you all meet together anymore, you're not a church, you cannot meet like this. And so our efforts that year of baptizing 20 people, we don't know where they are. We've not been able to contact them. Uh, breaks my heart. Can I go back there? Well, I've been back two or three times to that same city, and I found one or two of them. But uh, they're afraid to talk to us because if they saw it, they're in danger. Brethren have asked, aren't you scared going over there? I told Ray this morning, I said, absolutely not. Now, when I was in Tucson, you didn't go down to the bar yet. <laughs> uh, that was dangerous. <laughs> that was much more dangerous than walking around a Chinese city at 1 o'clock in the morning uh, because you're safe. The crime rate, we would, we would die to have a crime rate like that. Uh, but it's... It's safe. The only danger is, is that if we get caught teaching the people, they take you down to the airport and they put you on a plane and they send you home. Now, the amazing thing is they take all your money. And that plane ticket costs exactly what you had in your wallet. <laughs> so we learned. We tried not to carry <laughs> big sums of them. Um, money, but you got to have some. Uh, that's a whole other lesson on that. So, these are the Chinese characters, and all we try to do that is to, to get them interested to come to the Bible. Are you interested? Would you like to, to learn more about the Bible and the Chinese and the, the language on it? Jack got you hooked also. And, uh, yeah, that's a Bible books. <laughs> and you can read uh, the interesting history of how we came up with this. But, it is fascinating. And one thing that I have from that is I have a greater faith in the stories of the early part of Genesis. It's not just our made-up history and myth. It's the history of the Chinese people in their language. And they recognized it. And uh, so, pick up your Bible. Read Genesis with a new perspective on what it actually teaches about mankind. I'm assuming we're supposed to quit a quarter after. Thank you.